Hi guys and welcome to the longest video on my channel. Today I am back with a solved or is it solved true crime case that was incredibly incredibly famous and popular in France in the early 90s. You might have heard about it. Today I'm going to be talking about the Omar Mathieu or the Omar Haddad case. That's how it's known in France. It is one of the most controversial cases in France as well and I remember hearing about it growing up. I have wanted to cover this case ever since I decided to cover Estelle Mouzin's case on my channel which is the first true crime video I ever filmed and I'm finally getting around to it. This took quite a lot of research and it's gonna be a long video so grab a coffee, get comfortable if you live in the UK grab a hot water bottle. None of us can afford to pay for these energy bills. That's exactly what I'm doing. I've got a hot water bottle with me to keep me warm during this filming session. And if you ever need a break, I will be putting timestamps and little paragraphs or little chapters in this video if you ever feel the need to come back to it and finish the video later. I will be trying to film this all in one go. If you see me switch angles or look a bit different, just bear with me. I might need to take a couple of breaks. Um, just before I get started, there will be an announcement at the end of the video, so please stay tuned for that. Also, please remember to like and subscribe. I am so close to a thousand subscribers, so thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed so far. I love all of you, and without further ado, let's just dive right into this case. Guylaine Marchal was born on February 18, 1926, and by 1991, she was a 65-year-old widow. She had one son with her first husband, and her last husband was Jean-Pierre Marchal, who owned a car part and supply company that was very successful in France. It was called Marchal after his last name, and it was mainly popular for its cat logo and for selling car light bulbs, amongst other things. And when Jean-Pierre Marchal passed away, Guylaine became the sole heir of the Marchal fortune. She would spend most of her time in Switzerland, but she did have a holiday home, a holiday villa in the south of France in Mougin, which is near Cannes. If you're familiar with the Cannes Festival, that's the area she used to go to in the summer whenever she wanted to spend time in her beautiful villa and she named this villa La Chamade, which is a French word for the beating of drums that signal capitulation in a battle. In 1991, she was actually planning on spending most of her summer there, and on Sunday, June 23rd, she was getting herself ready for the day because she had a birthday party in the afternoon with some friends, and she took a shower around 11.45, then called her friend Erica very briefly to invite her over for lunch the next day, so Monday noon, and it was a very, very short conversation. It was just a quick invite, basically, a last-minute invitation because she was supposed to be at her friend's house for one o'clock for the birthday party, for the birthday lunch. So she had just gone out of the shower, placed a quick phone call, got herself ready. By 1.30 p.m., her friends Colette and Morius were still waiting for her to turn up for the birthday lunch. It was very unlike her to be running late. She should have been there already. She was supposed to arrive at one o'clock, but they figured maybe she had just left a bit late. They tried phoning her at home. Obviously, this was before cell phones, so they called her house and nobody picked up. So they assumed that she was just running late. She was probably on her way. However, they did have other guests for the birthday party. So they decided to start lunch without her. And she actually never turned up for lunch, not even late, which was so out of character because she had actually confirmed that very morning that she would be coming over. So it's not like she had forgotten or that she no longer wanted to come. She was supposed to come and never made it. So they were a little bit concerned. Um, they tried calling her house again an hour later, but nobody picked up. They really weren't sure what was going on. So around six o'clock, Colette decided to actually go to Guylaine's house. They, she went to La Chamade herself to check up on her friend. She rang the doorbell at the gate, but nobody answered. It looked like nobody was home. And unfortunately, there wasn't much she could do. She wasn't just gonna stand outside the house forever. So she went back to her house, tried calling again, and nobody answered still. So they basically waited a little while and called again later that evening. They basically kept calling to see if maybe she had gone out for the day and gotten home late that night, but nobody ever picked up. 
The following day, on Monday, June 24th, Erica showed up for the lunch date she had arranged the day before. So she showed up at 11.30, just like Gilen had told her to. However, when she rang the doorbell, nobody answered. So again, this was very odd because she had made the plans. Gilen was the one to tell her friend when to turn up and now she wasn't answering the door what was going on. Why wouldn't she be there to welcome her friend? She figured something serious must have happened for Gilen to not answer the door or cancel plans without telling her. So obviously she had to head home. There was again, no point waiting outside the house without any answer. And she called Colette, who was a mutual friend of hers, because she was concerned. And of course, Colette had spent the afternoon before trying to reach Guylaine, so now she was very, very worried. Erica was now telling Colette that Guylaine wasn't home, not answering the door for a lunch they had organized. And that's when Colette made the decision to phone Francine Pascal, who was a neighbor and a good friend of Guylaine. Francine was very, very intrigued, so she ended up asking one of the neighborhood security guards for that entire neighborhood. I guess it was a rich area. They had a little security system going on in place, so she asked one of the security guards who had keys to the gate to open the gate and check inside the house for them or around the house to see if he could see anything in there to see if he could get any information as to what could possibly be going on. The front door actually hadn't been locked and the keys were still in the door. The house was very, very dark and very silent. It was very clear that nobody was inside the house. All the blinds were shut except for Guylaine's bedroom blinds and the bed hadn't been made. The keys were still in the door. There were no signs of forced entry, of course, because again, the door was open. It wasn't locked or anything like that. And there was no sign of disruption. It looked as if Guylaine had woken up that morning, gotten out of bed, had breakfast, left the tray on the bed, got up and just disappeared into thin air, leaving everything behind. So the security guard came back to tell Francine what he had seen, and obviously she knew something was wrong right away. Um, I think she was probably sending the security guard first in case there was any trouble or, you know, she didn't want to bump into anything spooky herself. But now that she knew the house was empty, she went inside herself to have a look around to see what she could make of the situation. And again, because there was nothing strange going on aside from the fact that Guylaine wasn't home, she decided to phone Guylaine's doctor because she figured maybe Guylaine got sick or she was in an accident, she needed to leave the house maybe in an ambulance or literally anything could have happened to her. Maybe her doctor knows about this, which is quite a smart move. Unfortunately, the doctor didn't know anything about Guylaine. There had been no recent calls. He hadn't been called out because she was ill. So that was a bit of a dead end. However, the doctor was now intrigued as well. So he turned up to the house. Now this is still Monday afternoon and he decided to have a look around himself. The only clues they could really get from inside the house, aside from the fact that it was just dark and quiet was the fact that Guylaine's purse was left behind. Nothing seemed to have been stolen though, but Guylaine's purse was left behind and her car was still in the driveway, so she could not have gone very far. By five o'clock, they were getting absolutely nowhere and that's when they decided to phone police and by 5.30, eight police officers arrived to look around the house, only to end up drawing the same conclusions that Guylaine's friends had, which is, no signs of forced entry, no sign of robbery or theft. And again, her car was there, her purse was still there. She couldn't have gotten very far. And police actually believe that Guylaine was still on her property. That's how close they believe she was to her house. They turned the house upside down figuratively for about two hours. They looked absolutely everywhere for her and found no signs of Guylaine. The only place they hadn't searched on her property yet was the basement of the house annex. So Guylaine had a house annex that had a basement in French. In France, we don't really have basements as such. I'm sure some people do. In France, we have something we call as the underground or the underfloor. And it's like a cave. We, ca we call it a cave most of the time, but it's basically the bare bones of below the house and you store a bunch of stuff there. Sometimes that's where you do your laundry, but it's definitely not like a cute basement where you would watch movies in. And that was the last place they hadn't checked. So they made their way to the house annex and you had to access it from a staircase that was outside on the side of the annex. And once you got down, there was a big metallic door 
stopping you from entering the cave. That was the entrance. They tried to get into the cave, however, it was locked, so they wasted a little bit of time going through Gideon's house trying to look for a set of keys that could maybe open that door. They finally found one in a cigar box that was in Gideon's bedroom. It contained a bunch of random keys that open random doors to the house. And this one, actually the key was labeled Chouffry, which is basically like heater room or a boiler room. That's the name we use in France. So obviously that's how they knew this was the right key for the cave. And I will be referring to this room or place as a cave, just because that's what, that's the word we use in France. But again, it's very much the bare bones of a basement. I'll, I'll show a few pictures just so you can have a better idea of what I'm talking about, but it's not like an actual cave you would find in nature. The key they used did work. Um, they managed to unlock the door. It was locked twice. However, once the door was unlocked, they still could not push it open. They really struggled. It took quite a while and a handful of officers to push the door open. It was as if something was blocking it. Police claimed that it took them about 20 minutes to basically push it enough for an officer to squeeze his hand through and a foot through to see what was blocking the door and move it out of the way. And after 20 minutes of effort, they finally managed to open the door fully. Once they stepped inside, they noticed the room was very dark. However, with the light coming from the outside of the cave, they could see blood on the walls. One of the officers used the key to the cave door to flip the light switch on and get a better view of what was going on in the cave. He already knew he didn't want to contaminate anything with his fingerprints. And once the light was on, that's when they found the body of Guylaine Marshall in a pool of her own blood. Guylaine was found lying face down. Her hands were above her head and the bathrobe she was wearing was hiked up to her waist. It was no longer covering the bottom half of her body. Near her body was her gold Cartier watch. It did have blood on it, but it hadn't been damaged and definitely hadn't been stolen. So I think police were slowly ruling out the idea of a robbery gone wrong. Again, nothing in the house seemed to have been stolen. Guylaine herself was covered in blood. She had suffered severe blows to the head and when they turned her around, they realized that she had gotten pretty much disemboweled. She had many stab wounds as well. And that's when police obviously knew that they would need an autopsy to find out more about what happened to Guylaine. And in the meantime, they started securing the crime scene and looking around the cave to see if they could find any clues or any other evidence. Looking around the cave, they found a message that had been written in blood on one of the doors. And the message said, Omar m'a tué, which translates to Omar killed me. And there was actually a second attempt at writing the message in blood on another door. However, this one was much more erratic and only spelled out Omar Mate. It looked as if Guylaine knew she was not going to survive her attack and she wanted to make sure that she could accuse her murderer before she passed away. One very interesting and bizarre observation police made when they were in that key was that the cave itself, or the floor and the walls, did have blood on them. However, outside of the cave, on the doorstep and up the staircase, there were no traces of blood whatsoever. It was incredibly clean. So it looked as if whoever had attacked and murdered Guylaine Marshall, the room, the entire scene, or the entire murder had been contained by the room. And somehow the person left without leaving any traces outside of that cave. That was very puzzling for quite a few police officers and they were also puzzled as to why the door would be blocked from the inside. There were two bloody handprints found on the floor suggesting that Guylaine might have tried to stand up at some point or push herself up and that could explain why there was blood found throughout the cave and not just in the area where her body was found, but none of it was very important in the end because right now police were looking at Guylaine's last confession on two doors and they needed to find out who Omar was and why would he want Guylaine dead. Police spoke to Francine Pascal to let her know what they had found and they asked her if she knew someone named Omar or if 
Guylaine knew someone named Omar, and she said that actually Omar was her gardener. He actually had been working for her the day before on Sunday, and he was also Guylaine's gardener, and the, he worked for the two of them. They liked him very much. He was actually quite liked by the two of them, and that's the only Omar she knew, so police immediately started looking into him. Omar Haddad was 28 at that time. He had spent most of his life in Morocco, that's where he was born and raised, and he lived with his mother and siblings while his father worked in France as a gardener and sent money back home to help them out. He had never really been to school, he didn't know how to read or write in Arabic or in French to be honest, and when he turned 23 he decided to join his father in France for just a summer just to see what France was like and spend some time with his dad. He didn't get to see him that often, but once he got to France he actually really enjoyed it and he made the decision to stay with his dad and become a gardener himself. They started working together and he later met Latifa, who quickly became his wife. They fell in love. They ended up having two children together. One of them at this time in 1991 was just a newborn. And of course, once he had Latifa and the family, his stay in France became more permanent. He would only occasionally go back to Morocco to visit his family. Overall, he seemed to quite like being a father. He liked his family. He liked working as a gardener. He lived a quite simple life. He seemed very pleased overall. He worked on quite a few different properties and he actually got along with all of his employers. Francine Pascal and Guylaine Marshall were like mothers to him. They mothered him quite a bit. They helped him out so much, especially in the beginning. They helped him out with paperwork because he was obviously so bad at French, he couldn't read or write in French, this was a whole new language to him, and they even helped him find a flat when he first arrived and looked for a place to stay with his wife. None of this background meant much to police at all because once they saw his name written in blood on both of those doors, he became their main suspect. That very Monday night, police issued a document to every single police station in France to inform them of the murder and to let them know that they suspected the murderer was Omar Haddad and that he was on the run. They were afraid that Omar was basically going to try and flee back to Morocco, but he wasn't actually on the run at all. He was arrested Tuesday morning in Toulon in front of his wife, his kids, and his in-laws and he did not resist arrest, he basically went with police. They brought him to the station for questioning and Omar actually had no clue why he was being arrested because again, he didn't speak French very well, but he also didn't seem nervous at all. He was, I wouldn't say he was relaxed and chilling, but he was just not too concerned. He was just like, oh, I'll just answer some questions and leave because again, he didn't realize he'd done anything wrong. In a very silly move, or some might argue in a very questionable move, police never offered Omar a lawyer or an interpreter. And that obviously made the entire interview or interrogation incredibly complicated because French wasn't his first language. He couldn't even read or write Arabic, let alone French. And he couldn't understand most of the words or most of the questions police were asking him. Officers happened to actually know Omar's father. He had been in France for much longer and because they knew his father spoke French, I guess they automatically assumed that Omar did as well, which is a very silly assumption. And police say that they denied the need for an interpreter because Omar was considered a francophone because he lived in France, I guess that was his status now, and that implied he spoke French, but again, they must have clearly realized throughout the interrogation this guy had absolutely no idea what was being asked of him. Omar noticed that police kept typing away on their little, would it have been a computer or like a typewriter, whatever they were using at the time, they would keep typing away even when he wasn't answering questions. Um, for the most part, he only replied yes or no. So I guess he was wondering what they would be typing, but again, he didn't question it too much. Um, he was mostly ashamed of not knowing French very well, so whenever police would ask him a question he didn't understand, he would respond with yes. I've done that before, you know, like you don't understand something and you're like, yes, and 
hope for the best. However, he also responded to certain questions in Arabic, which the officers didn't understand. Obviously, if they did, the interrogation would have been a lot easier. So he, again, found it odd that they would still type even when he responded in Arabic, which, you know, what, what could they be typing when they didn't know what he was saying anyway? It was very strange, but he trusted police. He had no reason to be concerned and that's why he wasn't too worried and didn't make a fuss of it. It's only once police showed him the pictures of Guylaine Marshall dead in her cave that he realized that she, first of all, had been murdered and was no longer alive. And once they showed the pictures of his name written on the doors, that's when he realized what he was being accused of. Because of course he did recognize his name. That's one of the few words he knew how to read or write. And that's when he realized he was being accused of having murdered Guylaine Marshall. The interrogation itself lasted 12 hours. Omar claimed that whenever he tried falling asleep, they would take the chair away from him and he, they would make him stand and he would try sleeping while standing. It was overall an awful interrogation that was incredibly long, but I must say he never once admitted to having murdered Guylaine Marshall, no matter the circumstances of the interrogation. He was very adamant that he never murdered or hurt or attacked Guylaine Marshall in any way, shape, or form. Omar actually wasn't supposed to be working that Sunday. He had asked Francine to work Sunday instead of Monday because he had Tuesday off. So if he could swap the Monday and the Sunday, he would have two days off in a row and that way he would be able to celebrate Eid with his family and his in-laws in Toulon. On Sunday morning, he arrived a little bit late to work, so he arrived at 8.15 instead of 8 a.m. That was because he had been working the whole week and he wasn't used to waking up early on a Sunday, so he snoozed a little bit and showed up a little bit late. But the rest of the day went on as usual. He worked throughout the morning and he stopped for lunch around noon. He got on his little scooter and on his way home, he stopped by a boulangerie to buy some bread. It was a very busy place. Obviously, Sunday lunchtime is probably the worst place to go buy bread and he had to stay in a queue for a little bit of time and then once he had his bread, he got back on his scooter and headed back to his flat. Now, once he got to his building, he actually bumped into one of his neighbors who was the local supermarket manager and then he went home, had a cheese sandwich for lunch, watched the French equivalent of The Price is Right, listened to some music, and then got back on his scooter and headed back to Francine's house. On his way back though, he stopped by a telephone booth to phone his wife. It was around 12.51 and he basically called his wife to let her know that he was working that day. He managed to get the Monday off so he would be in Toulon the next day to celebrate Eid with everyone. So he was just kind of letting her know the plans for the next day and he arrived back at Francine's house around 1 p.m. I want to say five past one so just just after one. He would normally start back at 1 30 that's you know his lunch break was an hour and a half but Francine's daughter actually bumped into Omar once he got back and she was actually surprised to see him back so early and she said oh you're already back and he said yeah I started a little bit late this morning I'm just gonna make up for it by starting early again and basically just, again, started his afternoon shift a little bit early to make up for the morning. Afternoon went on as usual, he did some gardening, and then once that was done, he went home, had a very uneventful evening, went to bed early, and then Tuesday morning, he got on a train to Toulon to see his family. Despite this alibi, he was obviously still the main suspect and Omar was put in jail. However, on their way to prison, police stopped by his flat to pick up the clothes he had been wearing on Sunday and any other relevant evidence or potential evidence that was, you know, around the Sunday shift uh, so that they could send it to forensics for further testing. So they stopped by his place, grabbed a bunch of his stuff from Sunday and then dropped him off in prison, I suppose. In jail, he was finally able to speak to a lawyer with the help of another prisoner who would do a lot of the translating for him because again, his French was very bad. And the other prisoner would also translate newspaper clippings for Omar so that Omar could kind of keep up with the story and see what was being said in the news because again, he couldn't really read French very well. 
On June 28, 1991, three doctors performed an autopsy on Guylaine Marchal and they discovered the following. Guylaine had received five blows to the head from the piece of timber that was found in the cave. So the door, I feel like I forgot to say this, I'm sorry. The door they were trying to push open for the cave was actually blocked by a folding bed, like a metallic folding bed a metal bar and a piece of wood, like a piece of timber. Sorry, I should have specified that, but Guylaine had received five blows to the head from the piece of timber that had been found in the cave that had her blood on it. She had defense wounds on her hands, likely from trying to protect herself and putting her hands above her herself or her head. She had around a dozen stab wounds all over her body, including a 30 centimeter wound from her sternum to her lower stomach, basically dragged across her and disemboweling her. There was no weapon found at the crime scene, aside from that piece of wood, but there was no sharp weapon found at the crime scene. But the examiners determined that the stab wounds were caused by a double-edged knife that was two centimeters wide and 15 to 20 centimeters long. And police initially believed the sharp weapon was a pair of garden shears. Omal was a gardener. He could have used garden shears to attack her. And there was a pair of them found in the garden shed. However, the examiners ruled that out completely It couldn't have been the garden shears. It had to be a double-edged knife that was two centimeters wide and 15 to 20 centimeters long. Two of the stab wounds were actually on the back of her left thigh. One of them had created a splatter of blood that was perpendicular to her legs, meaning that she had to have been lying down on her stomach when she received that stab wound when she was stabbed there and she would have had to remain lying down in that position for over seven minutes for the blood to coagulate and remain in that position. The examiners were not able to say for sure in which order the injuries were received or in which order the injuries occurred. They believed this attack could have taken place in about four minutes and the attacker started hitting her on the head with a piece of wood before stabbing her repeatedly with a double-edged knife. Given the intensities of the blow, they believed the attacker was, first of all, left-handed, but they also assumed he was a male just because of the, the strength needed behind these attacks. Um, that's just obviously what the doctors believed, so that's what they put in the autopsy report. And based on how the blood splattered, Whoever attacked Guylaine would definitely have had blood on them. Based on Guylaine's bloodstains, they don't believe she got up after her attack because if she had stood up, the hemorrhage in her liver would have filled her abdominal cavity and when they performed the autopsy, there was no blood or the abdominal cavity was empty. It was estimated that Guylaine laid there in agony for 15 to 30 minutes before dying from her injuries. There was absolutely no single cause of death. It was just an accumulation of the stab wounds and the blows to her head and everything else she had gone through. In a very, very controversial move, the judge authorized Guylaine Marchal's body to be cremated a few days later, and on July 3rd, 1991, her body was cremated. In these types of murder investigations, it, most of them, or most of the judges, or maybe even the family, would opt for a burial in case you ever needed to exhume the body and perform additional testing, check for fingerprints, or retrieve more DNA. For any reason that could help further the investigation, this was still very much an unsolved case or a case that was still being investigated. So it was very, very strange for the judge to authorize a cremation, especially so shortly after the murder. This decision was heavily questioned during trial. However, it wasn't as controversial as the date of death that was on the autopsy report because in the first document for the autopsy, Guylaine's date of death was declared to be Monday 24th between 11 and 1.30. Now, by that time, Omar was in Toulon with his family. He had the most solid alibi. And all three doctors who performed the autopsy had to basically reread the report before signing it, which meant that they were basically agreeing that the date of death was Monday the 24th between 11 and 1.30. 
Omar's lawyers only found out in November of 91 about this date error or this new date. And one month later, another document was attached to the autopsy report to explain that the original date was written incorrectly. It was just a typo. It happens. And it should have read Sunday the 23rd instead of Monday the 24th. However, this made investigators look like they were trying to fit the date of death with Omar's alibi or lack thereof. Because the doctors explained they made a mistake. They're, they're like, well, obviously we meant Sunday the 23rd and not Monday the 24th. No big deal. Just change it. But all three of them got the date wrong. That's a very serious mistake. That's the date of death that changes everything. And if they missed that detail when they you know, went over the report and signed it, what else did they miss? That's, again, a very serious mistake, and it could be enough to ask for a second autopsy performed by someone else. However, as we all know, Guillen's body was already cremated, so that was not an option. Both of the messages in the cave pointed to Omar, but what could he possibly gain from murdering Guillen, his employer? Police discovered that two days before the murder, Guylaine had withdrawn 5,000 francs in cash. She always carried an insane amount of cash in her bag at all times. Her friends knew that of her. She would get comments on it. She would just literally walk around with a bag full of cash. Um, that's just how she lived her life, I guess. But when officers checked her purse and wallet in her house, the wallet was empty. There was absolutely no cash there. In fact, the cash would never be found. It turns out that Omar had previously asked Francine and Guylaine for an advance on his paycheck because he was behind on rent. Once police found that out, they started digging, and it turns out that Omar was a regular at the local casino. He would go there a couple of times a week, and police also discovered that he would spend money on prostitutes. So obviously, police and the media were very, very quick to portray Omar as a family man who spent his money or his rent money on gambling and prostitutes. And they even went as far as to question his faith and his morals. Now, to be fair, he did go to the casino uh, quite a few times. He did admit to that. He's like, yeah, I go to the casino every once in a while. So what? But his wife wasn't aware of that. So that did make him look bad. And he said that he only ever played the slot machines. It's not like he was playing blackjack or like betting hundreds and thousands, you know, on red or something. He was just playing the five franc slot machines and he would try to only play the money he would win. Um, so again, he was like, yeah, I do go to the casino every once in a while. And no, I guess I didn't tell my wife about it, but he didn't see the big deal about it. It's not like he was spending all his money there. Um, however, he firmly denied any accusations of him spending money on prostitutes or even being remotely involved with prostitutes. I will discuss this entire um, prostitute debacle in further detail when I cover the trial part of this video or this case. But essentially, police believe that Omar wanted an advance on his paycheck. He needed money to go gambling, to go see prostitutes, and maybe even pay his rent at some point. Who knows? And when Guylaine said no, he got angry and attacked her and then stole whatever money was in her purse. I do want to point out that we actually don't know how much money was in her purse that Sunday morning. For all we know, she could have spent all of it before then, or she could have had all 5,000 francs in it. Nobody but Guylaine would know how much money was in that purse. So it's difficult to say that this was a crime motivated by money because for all we, or that money had been stolen from the purse at all because we don't even know if there was any money in her wallet. There most likely was since she always carried cash on her, but we don't know if the full 5,000 francs were there. On November 18th, 1991, Omar went on a hunger strike for over a month. He wanted to get the judge's attention. He wasn't trying to harm himself. He wasn't being emo or anything. He just was desperate to get the judge's attention because he wanted to be released from prison. He was innocent. He 
told everyone he was innocent and he had no business being in prison. So the only way he could get the judge's attention or even the media's attention was to go on a hunger strike. And his doctor grew quite concerned, obviously, because the hunger strike lasted over a month. And it's only when Omar's father spoke to him in prison that he managed to convince him to start eating again, which he did. On February 18th, 1991, which um, I'll point out is... Guylaine's birthday, he was driven back to La Chamade for a scene recreation with police and the judge and the lawyers and everyone else. However, he refused to leave the car because, again, he explained to police, I wasn't there that day, I wasn't in her cave, and I didn't murder her, so how could you possibly want me to be involved in a scene recreation when I don't know what happened? So again, he refused to leave the car, and the recreation went on without him. The police and whoever else attended this scene recreation was mostly, like, they spent most of their time trying to figure out if there was a way to block the cave door from the outside. So basically to block it inside from the outside while leaving, or if this was blocked from the inside by Guylaine. A few months later, on April 16th, 1992, Omar went on a second hunger strike, and this time he lost 20 kilos, and he was already a very slim man. So this was, you know, very concerning. The judge was still not budging at all, so Omar was like, fine, I'll stop drinking as well, which terrified his doctor. His doctor was like, please, uh, like, it's bad enough, you've lost enough weight, don't stop drinking. But again, Omar was not trying to hurt himself. He just wanted attention. That's how serious he was. He literally stopped eating for ages and then stopped drinking. He did manage to get the judge's attention. However, it's not the outcome he expected. The judge met him in June to tell Omar that he would be spending another year in prison. And that's when Omar realized that his hunger strikes or his drinking strike was going to get him nowhere and that he should start eating again and get strong and fit again so that he could fight in court and be acquitted and get justice for himself. Not long before trial, he was moved to another place, which is basically like the equivalent of a county jail. I think when you're close to trial, they move you closer to where the trial happens. And the room he was given was awful. Like the toilets were clogged, the walls were dirty as hell, the outlets were broken, like it was just shambolic. And Omar like obviously couldn't stay in that place. He asked to be moved to another place, but they refused. So he was like, fine. He decided to swallow a razor blade, which was wrapped in bread, like in a slice of bread, I guess. He put bread all around it and swallowed it. And then he told the security guards that he swallowed a razor blade. And I guess they must be used to hearing a lot of nonsense. So they just didn't believe him because they're like, okay, yeah, you swallowed a razor blade, good one, because who would swallow a razor blade, to be honest? So they didn't take him seriously, and he's like, y'all think I'm joking, so he got another razor blade. I do not know where this man is getting all of these razor blades from, but this time he's like, fine, I'm gonna prove to them that I'm serious, and he decided to cut himself on the arm. Again, he did not want to die. He wasn't injuring himself to bleed out. He was trying to basically just like get anyone to believe him because he's like, this is insane. No one thinks I'm serious. Get me out of here. This room is awful. And it did work. This time it worked. I think the security guards were like, okay, he's not joking. He just cut himself. And they finally moved him to a normal room. It wasn't luxury. It was just not a shitty room. And that's where he ended up spending 10 months waiting for his trial to begin. The trial began on January 24th, 1994, and Omar was now only represented by one lawyer instead of three. He originally had three of them, but they did not see eye to eye, so he basically had to make the very difficult decision to drop two of them and keep just one. And the one lawyer who remained was Jacques Vergès. This decision sparked a lot of controversy because Jacques Vergès was famous for defending criminals such as Klaus Barbie, who was a Nazi, Carlos, who was a terrorist from Venezuela, amongst other very, very questionable and controversial characters. He was also friends with Pol Pot, if I'm saying that correctly. He was a Cambodian dictator who led the Khmer Rouge party. He was also known as the lawyer of terror. So Jacques Vergès was known as the 
terror lawyer or the lawyer of terror that's doesn't translate very well in English but basically he was very famous for defending um, people who were guilty or criminals who were guilty so obviously because he was now representing Omar Haddad people started to believe that Omar must be guilty because his lawyer tended to defend criminals on top of that, going from three to just one lawyer 10 days before trial really, really weakened Omar's defense. He shocked the court by only speaking in Arabic. He had an interpreter there who would translate everything he said and um, translate the questions he was being asked. But the reason he pulled that stunt on his lawyer's advice was basically to highlight the fact that during his first interrogation, he was not given an interpreter and therefore the entire interrogation should have been nullified because he did not speak or understand French very well at all. On the side of the prosecution, Guylaine's family chose Henri Leclerc as their lawyer because they actually already knew him, but also because he happened to be the vice president of the Human Rights League in France. This was absolutely no coincidence. I think they were trying to make sure that their lawyer would be very fair and couldn't possibly be accused of racism towards Omar Haddad. And obviously because he was um, part of the Human Rights League, then he wouldn't be biased or racist towards the accused. I'm going to go over some of the main points that were brought up in court, the most important ones, the, the highlights of the court, and uh, this is going to be, you know, a long section. I'll give you both sides of each argument as I bring the arguments up. They're not in any particular order. I'm just going to start with the alibi. So during his lunch break, Omar told police that he left around noon, hopped on his scooter, stopped at a boulangerie to get some bread, um, bumped into his neighbor when he got home, had some lunch, watched TV, listened to some music, got back on his scooter to go back to work early, and then on his way back to work, he phoned his wife from a phone booth. When police took him to jail um, after his first interrogation and, you know, they stopped by his flat on the way, they also stopped by a boulangerie. And Omar didn't realize what police were doing because they never told him what they were doing. But basically, on their way back to his flat, they stopped by a boulangerie and went inside and pointed at Omar, who was still in the police car, basically asking the staff if they recognized him and if he had been in the day before to buy some bread around lunchtime. None of them recognized him. Even from their shop, I guess they were looking into the car and looking at Omar and basically telling police, no, we don't remember seeing him, and then police left. Omar obviously had no idea. He thought that police just wanted to buy some bread on their way to prison. He didn't really question it. However, if they had told Omar what they were doing, he would have been able to tell them that this was the wrong boulangerie. And in France, any village has a certain amount of boulangeries and it's, not, it's never just one unless it's a very small village. And this was not the boulangerie he usually went to. He was a regular at another one that was actually quite close, but Again, different place. And because they didn't go to the right boulangerie, of course, the staff from the one they went to didn't remember seeing Omar on Sunday lunch just because he was never there. So that mistake cost Omar quite a lot because that could have potentially cleared him as a suspect. So if he had gone to that boulangerie, like he said he did, and police checked with the correct boulangerie and they identified him, then that pretty much would have ruled him out right away. The neighbor Omar bumped into told investigators that he actually didn't remember seeing Omar that day, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't there. So the guy was like, well, I didn't, I don't remember seeing Omar around lunchtime, but that, that doesn't mean anything. I wasn't really paying attention to anyone around me. And also this guy who was like a supermarket manager told police that it was very, very unusual for him to be at his flat or in his building around lunchtime on a Sunday. This was very, this was a one-off basically. So it's not Omar could have guessed based on routine as an alibi being like, oh, I even bumped into this guy because Omar would know that the guy was always there. He actually told police, look, I am actually was near my building around lunchtime. I don't remember seeing him, but I was there and this was unusual. So this was a little bit you know, ambiguous. Police didn't quite know whether or not that alibi stood or didn't. It wasn't consistent enough. So they decided to bring in a witness to court. 
And this was a lady who lived in the same building as Omar and the other neighbor. And she had been waiting for her daughter to come home for lunch that day. She was on her balcony from 11.30 to 12.45 looking out for her daughter while preparing lunch. And she told police or she testified in court that she never saw Omar or his scooter. Now, her husband actually came forward to say like look just because we didn't see him doesn't mean that he didn't that he wasn't there like just because we never happened to see him didn't, doesn't mean that he didn't come home and also his wife was preparing lunch so she would like go back and forth from the kitchen to the balcony so maybe she could have missed it then like maybe she could have missed him when she wasn't looking outside because obviously she had to look after her lunch as well. This witness statement was quite debated or contested by the defense team because unfortunately this neighbor had suffered a stroke a couple of months or years prior and this stroke actually did um, medically like affect her cognitive issues including memory loss so obviously that did make the defense claim that her testimony was a bit worthless because she could have either misremembered or she could have easily missed Omal when she was cooking in the kitchen. So this was a little bit more inconclusive. Now, as for the phone call he made to his wife, the prosecution was thrilled to say that actually in his first interrogation, Omar claimed he phoned his wife after work. So when he was done with his shift that day on his way home, Omar in his first interrogation said he phoned his wife from that phone booth after work. So later in the day, it's only when police checked the phone records for that phone booth that they realized the call was placed at 12.51 and they came back to Omar to say, no, you actually phoned your wife at lunchtime. And he's like, oh yeah, you're right. I He basically misremembered. And that's what Omar said in court. He basically just misremembered when he called his wife. And the fact that he actually phoned his wife during lunchtime would help his alibi, surely. But the prosecution just used that mistake against him to basically ask the court if it wasn't in Omar's nature to lie, just like he lied to his wife about gambling. After all, he was behind on rent and he clearly needed money for prostitutes and gambling, which is why he murdered Guilen when she wouldn't give him an advance. Omar had already denied his involvement with prostitutes, but the reason why the prosecution had brought it up was because during his interrogation, police asked him if he ever, I don't know why, police asked him if he had ever spent time with prostitutes and he answered yes. Now, as I've explained previously, most of the time he had no idea what police was asking him. He would just answer yes or no. And actually a lot of the time, if he really didn't understand the question, he would just say yes and like hope for the best. Just kind of be like, yeah. And that's exactly what happened then. According to Omar, of course, he said that he didn't even know the word prostitute in French. That's not a word he'd ever heard of or used in his vocabulary since moving to France. And he just happened to randomly, you know, respond yes to that question unfortunately so police were like oh cool so you're seeing prostitutes and that's why you need money so police claim that two prostitutes testified being with him but only one of them was brought to trial and she essentially took the stand to say that she saw him once in the street like she remembered seeing him once in the street and they made intense eye contact that was it that's not really a sexual transaction, is it? And then the second prostitute police claimed was involved with Omar never came to court or because never came to trial because she was actually never invited. She didn't agree with what police had typed up during her interview. Like she wasn't happy with the the final, like, I don't know, the confession that, or the testimony that they typed up, typed up for her after the interview. So basically she was like, no, I don't like this, um, not interested. So of course they didn't invite her to trial. So that angle was kind of dismissed, but the prosecution did believe that the motive was still money, that Omar must have needed money badly. And they brought up the fact that Omar was behind on rent and that he had previously asked for money in advance. Guilin's cleaning lady, Liliane, actually testified against Omar. She was quite vicious in court. She, she, was, she had something against him. She claimed that he had asked for an advance multiple times and that Guilin was really tired of it. 
In reality, Audemars had only asked Guylaine and or Francine, I'm not sure if it was both of them, for an advance. He, he had only asked them twice and he would only ever ask to be paid for work he had already done. So it's not like at the beginning of the month he was already broke again and was asking for money for work he hadn't even started yet. It's more like imagine if you're paid monthly and like halfway through the month you're like, can you just pay me for the two work two weeks I've just worked? and then pay me again in two weeks for the next two weeks. So basically he would just ask to be paid sooner, but it's not like he was asked to be paid for work he never did. Does that make sense? So that's what he explained to the court and he wasn't denying it. He's like, yeah, I did ask like twice for money in advance, but Liliane accused him of basically being a bad Muslim, mainly because she saw him eating lunch during Ramadan once or multiple times, I don't know. I'm not too familiar with Islam. I'm pretty sure that doesn't make you a bad person or a bad Muslim, but she was pretty determined to like make him look bad or point out just how flawed his personality was. Investigators also discovered that over the past two years, Omar had withdrawn up to 80,000 francs from his bank account. They speculated it was because of gambling and prostitutes, but Omar simply explained that the money actually belonged to his brother who did not own a bank account in France and whenever he would work he would get paid into Omar's account and whenever his brother wanted to go back to Morocco he would take the money with him so he would withdraw large sums from Omar's account which is why there was so much money in his account it's because two salaries or maybe even three I'm not sure if Latifa was working were going in there and then would occasionally be, be withdrawn when his brother would go back to Morocco. Now Omar never denied that he was occasionally behind on rent or that at the time of the murder he was behind on rent um, just by one month and his landlord actually took the stand to say that Omar would always always end up paying his rent even if it was sometimes late Overall, the landlord was not concerned about Omar as a tenant or about Omar's finances. He was like, look, he pays late sometimes, but he always does pay up. And if, even if, you know, he wants to go to the casino or whatever, whatever else he wants to spend his money on, that doesn't necessarily mean he was in debt or struggling. Maybe, you know, maybe he should pay his rent first and, I don't know, spend his money on something else later. But, you know, I know a lot of people my age still who don't even pay their rent first and might like spend money on things they enjoy and then kind of like run out of money for rent and pay it a bit late. That doesn't make you a bad person. So anyway, Omar argued that just because Guylaine had taken out cash two days before her murder and police couldn't find that money, it didn't mean that he was the one who had stolen it. They had absolutely no evidence of Omar stealing the money. There was no money on him when they arrested him um, in Toulon, there was no money hidden in his flat, like there was absolutely no trace of any cash he could have stolen from anywhere. And no one but Guylaine knew how much money was in her wallet that morning, so there might have actually been no money there to steal. So Omar said that if he really was desperate, he would just steal money, I guess. I mean, that's what most people would probably do. He's like, there's absolutely no need to brutally murder someone. He's like, if I was that desperate for money, I would just steal money from a place or from someone and then in that very situation he definitely would have stolen her gold Cartier watch that's probably worth a fortune and some of the very very fancy expensive jewelry that was in her house amongst other expensive possessions she had in her house. The psychiatric evaluation concluded that he was very much in control of his emotions. He didn't seem prone to outbursts of temper. He had no cognitive difficulties. He had no evidence of pathological lying. He didn't have any mental illnesses and he had no criminal past. They also noticed, because obviously psychiatrists are doctors, they noticed that he had an injury in his right hand that had weakened it, though that didn't mean he couldn't use it. They just noticed that he had an injury in his right hand. And they also noticed that there was no indication that he was psychologically capable of murdering anyone. Obviously, that doesn't mean there aren't exceptions, but the psychiatric evaluation was quite favorable for Omar, and despite all of this, the prosecution kept attacking Omar's character, his religion, 
and his morals. And there was a very, very strong undertone of racism throughout the trial and in the media throughout this entire case before and after court. His wife, Latifa, took the stand to defend her husband and said, Omar is a good husband, a good father, and he is a good man who wouldn't hurt a fly. To which the president of the court responded, except when he slaughters the sheep for Eid, insinuating that Omar could be violent for his own religion, so therefore he could be violent for something else. Basically saying, oh, you're saying he's this good man, but he has no trouble slaughtering sheep for his own religion. Anyway, this comment outraged a lot of people. Don't worry, Guillen's sister was not shocked or offended by it. She said that during trial, you need to let a few jokes slide to relieve some of the tension and, you know, kind of like relax the atmosphere. Obviously, she wasn't offended by that comment because she wasn't the one whose character, religion, or faith, or anything else was, you know, being attacked or commented on. But there was absolutely no need for that comment anyway, even if it was a joke, because all it did was reinforce the notion that the president of the court was convinced Omar was guilty and he was very, very vocal about it. Later during that trial, the prosecutor at one point told Omar, Omar up to which Omar's lawyer, outraged, responded, you wouldn't talk like that to someone named Mr. Smith. You would say, Mr. Smith, please stand. Omar is not a dog. So there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of uh, heated moments during this trial based on, you know, Omar's just background, you know, where he was from, his religion, things like that. That definitely played a huge role and I don't think anyone could ever deny the the role racism played in this entire trial or in this entire case. After all of these comments and the prosecution's attack on his character and his religion, Omar said, the president of the court seemed to have forgotten to judge me on whether I killed Guylaine Marshall and not on whether I was a good Muslim. He and his wife did defend themselves against Liliane, the cleaning lady, um, her allegations, and they even flipped the script saying she did not have the same friendship or relationship that Omar did, or even Omar and Latifa did with Guylaine Marshall, and she was basically jealous of how well they got along and how close they were. She was also the only other person to have a set of keys for Guylaine's house and her alibi was a little bit shady because she was actually supposed to work the next day on Monday and she claimed that she was off because Guylaine had told her to take the day off. And Omar found that very odd because Guylaine never cooked for herself and especially not when guests would come over and obviously Guylaine had literally invited Erika for lunch the next day, so it seems like a very bad day to have your cleaning lady or whatever her role was, you know, helping out to cook. It would be a very bad day to have her off if you know you're gonna have company over. So anyway, Omar was trying to highlight that and according to Latifa, Guylaine suspected the cleaning lady Liliane of stealing from her, but there was never any actual evidence of that. Um, I definitely find it very interesting that Lilian's ex, the person she was dating at the time of the murder, had been charged with murder himself back in 83, in 1983, but police actually never really looked into him as a suspect or never really considered him a potential suspect. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, so that was something else that was brought up to court. Before I bring up the main debate in this trial, I'm just going to show you a layout of the cave, um, talk you through the crime scene just so you're a bit more familiar with the facts and how the cave looks and where the rooms are. This cave is basically where a lot of the pool supplies could be found, including the heater for the pool and the cleaning system for the pool. So that's basically what police assumed um, Guylaine was doing when she was attacked, she had left the shower in her bathrobe, called her friend, and then once she invited her friend over for lunch the next day, she was probably thinking, oh, she might want to use the pool. Let me turn on the cleaning system or maybe the heating system for the pool. So she went to the cave, went to the boiler room um, for the pool and then turned it on because on Monday that system was still active. I don't believe anyone thinks that 
Guylaine was lured, <laughs> so hard to say, lured to the cave. Like she was never tricked into going to the cave. Um, she was most likely confronted there and attacked there. That's where she happened to be at the time. But I'm just going to put some pictures and talk you through the layout of the cave before I move on. Now, as I've explained before, the cave was accessed by the staircase that went down under the annex and the door was blocked by a folding bed, a metal bar, as well as a piece of wood. And this was pretty much the view officers got when they entered the cave. It was quite a big room. This was one of the doors that had the partial message written on it. This was the boiler room and this was the door that had the full message written on it and that was a door that was close to the entrance. Now this is the layout of the actual cave from above. As you can see, it is quite big. The first arrow is the entrance. That is the metallic door that, as we know, was blocked by those three items. And when police entered, they had a little look around and it's once they made their way towards the boiler room that they noticed the body of Guylaine Marshall in a pool of her own blood. And now the boiler room was the boiler room for the pool and the door of the boiler room was the one that had the partial message. So Omar Maté, however, the full message was way back up there close to the entrance and that was the room to the wine cellar. That was a wine cellar room and the door was locked at the time. The first little star you see on the left is where one of the dentures of Guylaine Marshall was found and that's where police believe the initial attack happened. And then the second star you see popping up on the screen is where they found her gold Cartier watch. The third star is where they found Guylaine's right shoe and the fourth star is where they found Guylaine's left shoe, so right next to her body. I will add two other stars and that's where um, investigators actually found a bloody paper bag as well as a bloody plastic bag. The blood only ever matched Guylaine's blood and we're not really sure if the bags were already in the cave or if they were brought by the attacker. Now this is what the prosecution believes happened on that Sunday. Omar went to work for Francine Pascal, so Guylaine's neighbor. On Sunday, he was not working for Guylaine. He was working for her neighbor, Francine. And the morning went by as usual. During his lunch break, they believe he went to Guylaine's house to ask for an advance, a salary advance, but she refused. And because he was desperate for money, this made him very angry. He grabbed the closest item, object, weapon he could Find, which was a piece of timber, a piece of wood, and repeatedly hit her on the head out of anger. And then once he realized what he had done, he decided to kill her so that he couldn't get in trouble and she couldn't report him to police. So that's when he decided to grab a pair of garden shears and stabbed her multiple times until he was sure she was dead or could not get back up. He then left the cave, locked it twice, put the keys back in the garden shed with the garden shears, which he had somehow cleaned. And then he went inside the house, stole money from her wallet, raced to the phone booth to call his wife and give himself kind of an alibi. And then he went back to work early to give himself more of an alibi that way you know, if he's at work early, he's like, I wouldn't have had time to attack anyone. Meanwhile, Guylaine managed to get up and move the folding bed, which was about 12 kilos. So she managed to gather enough strength to get up, move the folding bed, the piece of wood and a bar, like a metal bar against the door so she would be sure that nobody else could come back in. And then she started writing the first message on the wine cave door, which was close to the main door, then turned off the light, crawled back to the boiler room where she then tried to write the same message again, this time closer to the ground, probably because she was still on the ground when she was trying to write it and couldn't finish it. And then that's where she collapsed and died. Now, basically, the prosecution was convinced Omar murdered Guylaine out of anger because he needed money. 
but they don't believe that the murder was premeditated. They think it was um, heat of the moment, basically. Of course, the defense believed Omal was innocent, so they argued that just because people didn't see him go home during lunchtime um, doesn't mean that he wasn't there or that he didn't go home, um, especially given the fact that police checked with the wrong boulangerie. So, you know, that's... That's the prosecution's problem, but unfortunately, it's now Omal's problem. But if he had gone from Francine's house to Guylaine's house during his lunch break to ask for money and then, you know, eventually come back, he would have to walk 800 meters on like a little like tiny street, more of a path, which is where, you know, all the houses were on that neighborhood. There's only one dead end street that goes there. So people would have seen him on that path. And then surely he would have been seen at some point during one of his trips to Guylaine's house. The investigators had established that Omar never changed out of his clothes that day. So Francine and her daughter confirmed that the clothes he had been wearing in the morning were the exact same ones he was wearing in the afternoon and they hadn't been washed after his shift so when police dropped by his house to pick up the clothes he had been wearing on sunday and the shoes he had been wearing on sunday for forensic testing they realized that he hadn't washed the clothes and also um he there were no traces of blood or dna on him like none nothing was ever found on his clothing and the defense argued you know how could you ever commit such a brutal murder um, such a bloody murder without getting anything on your clothes or on your shoes um, or even like defense wounds for that matter but the defense believed that he was being framed basically there was someone else who had murdered Guylaine Marshall they believed the attacker murdered her before dragging her to the boiling room which would explain why she had drag marks on her legs and why she was found with her hands above her head and her bathrobe hiked up past her hips because obviously if you're pulling someone by the feet that's what would happen that is consistent with how the body was found and then the defense argued that the attacker or murderer would have written both messages with her hand and her blood before leaving the cave and blocking the door from the outside the prosecution claimed that the murder weapon was the garden shears found near the keys in the garden shed however this was because they believed Omar was the murderer and Omar was a gardener. So they're like, oh, he must have used these garden shears because they couldn't find any other weapons around that could fit um, a knife or something sharp. But the medical examiners were adamant that the garden shears could not be the, the weapon that caused the stab wounds. Um, they were very clear that the weapon had to be um, a double-edged knife and had to be a very specific size and width. And additionally, the garden shears themselves had only very, very minor traces of blood that were so, so minor that it was impossible to tell if they were from human blood or animal blood. So where was the second murder weapon? They found the piece of wood, the piece of timber that was used to um, strike her on the head, but they never found the knife or whatever had caused the stab wounds. The prosecution also brought in experts claiming that Guylaine's bathrobe would have absorbed the blood splatter caused by the stab wounds. I have a lot of issues with that. So a lot of the stab wounds were on her torso so I guess would have been covered by the bathrobe however some of the stab wounds like on the back of her thighs were not covered by the bathrobe so how could it have possibly contained the blood splatter and also the blows to her head were very um, bloody and did create blood splatter which is why police found blood on the walls and on the floor so again the head couldn't have been covered by the bathrobe so how could you argue that there was no blood splatter created by this attack or that it would have been contained by the bathrobe when really clearly that was impossible and since there was obvious blood splatter caused by this attack how could Omar not change his clothes and then not wash them and still get out of this without any DNA or blood, like none, like n zero, not even a speck of blood on his clothing. How is that even possible? That make it make sense. Now there was a bit of back and forth regarding Omar's name on the walls or on the doors. 
Omar never actually worked Sundays. As I've said, this was a one-off. He wanted two days off in a row. He swapped his Monday for a Sunday. And because this was an exception, very, very few people would know that Omar was working that Sunday. So you could argue that if someone wanted to frame Omar and it wasn't Omar who had murdered Guylaine, they would have to know that he was working that day because otherwise he might have a very good alibi. Now, I do want to point out it's possible that if Omar wasn't the attacker and that he was being framed, that maybe the attacker didn't expect Guilen to be found very quickly, or maybe they didn't expect the date of death to be accurate, or maybe they just didn't care and wanted to blame someone else and throw police off of their scent. However, it was a very interesting fact that Omar wasn't even supposed to work that day, so how could anyone framing him actually know he was in that day? Doctors determined that despite her injuries, Guylaine was actually able to move around after her attack, which again goes against what the, ex um, the coroners or the medical examiners say it in their autopsy. They don't believe she ever got up after the attack. Prosecution brought in doctors who claimed that she did have the potential to have energy to get up and move around and somehow move a 12 kilo folding bed, a metal rod, and a piece of wood to block the door. If she had been attacked by Omar and recognized him, then obviously the messages accusing Omar were gospel. They were factual and doctors confirmed that at the time of her attack, she would have been clear-minded enough to recognize her attacker. However, again, if Omar's not the one who attacked her, then blaming Omar was very risky because he didn't usually work Sundays. So again, either he did it or someone else did. Someone must have known that Omar worked that Sunday or maybe didn't care. Either way, the defense mentioned the fact that the initial autopsy report stated the date of death as Monday 24th when Omar had a very strong alibi. He was with his in-laws and his family in Toulon and they accused the prosecution of making the evidence fit Omar's alibi or Omar's schedule. They were like, oh no, no, you're, you're switching it back to Sunday 23rd because that's when Omar was working and you want this to fit. Now, I will say getting the date wrong is a huge, huge error. Again, as I've said before, so the autopsy report was incorrect and the doctors were like, oops, sorry, wrong day, and then changed it, corrected it. But obviously this was, again, such a big mistake. If Guylaine's family hadn't had her body cremated so quickly after the murder, then they might have been able to confirm or double check the actual date of death. Guylaine's sister and the judge who signed the authorization to have Guylaine's body cremated explained that it was not controversial or strange that they allowed Guylaine to be cremated so quickly despite this huge murder investigation going on. Um, her family explained that in her will she stated she wanted to be cremated despite the fact that she had purchased a family plot at the local cemetery in Mujan where her ex-husband or her her previous husband was buried and I believe her parents were as well. Um, I'm not sure about her parents but there was a family plot there that she was supposed to be buried in and apparently in her will she stated that she wanted to be cremated however police never checked the will to see if the family was telling the truth so it's hard to tell if they were quickly trying to cover something up or if they genuinely wanted to fulfill her wishes, her last wishes of being cremated and not bury her. It's very, again, because they never checked the will, we'll never know. And because they never checked the will, actually, nobody knew um, who would actually benefit from her death. Obviously, she had only one son, so he would be the one who stood to gain everything from her. I'm assuming he had an alibi for that day. I. I've done a stupid amount of research and couldn't find what his alibi was, but obviously I'm assuming police looked into this. Um, and I don't believe police looked into anyone else who could have profited from Guylaine's death. I know some people have said her family, her siblings and um, in-laws or, you know, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, whoever, um, were linked to some important people. So I don't know what the will said. We'll never know. I don't know who's actually stood to benefit financially aside from her only son. And I believe police checked and 
determined that the son would not be a suspect. The only element that actually really mattered in this case, since everything else was so ambiguous, I mean, then again, so is this one, but the only thing that really, really, truly mattered was figuring out who wrote the messages on these doors, because the prosecution believed that these messages were Guylaine's last confessions before she died. It was her way of accusing her murderer and solving the case from the grave. But the forensics show that the messages were definitely written in her blood, but it was just so important to figure out who had written the messages, because if Guylaine had written them, then Omar was the killer. If Guylaine hadn't written them, then Omar was automatically being framed because obviously Omar wouldn't write his own name on the walls, right? He would be the only other person who, like, he wouldn't frame himself, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So basically they needed to be able to prove whether or not Guylaine had written these messages. And now the forensics show that the messages were definitely written in her blood. That was a fact. The ultimate question being who would make that spelling error? Because unless you're already familiar with like French or this case, I haven't mentioned it yet, but Omar Mathieu has a massive grammatical spelling error in it. It's supposed to be Omar Mathieu with an accent on the E. The tué or the killed part was not conjugated properly. I suppose in English, I guess the closest example I could give or like, I don't know, the close, closest comparison I could make to this would be like writing Omar killed me instead of Omar killed me. So if you're not really good at conjugation or English or maybe certain dialects would conjugate the wrong way, then that would explain why you wrote it this way. But again, it was incorrect. And would a fancy, classy, sophisticated woman such as Guylaine Marshall really make a spelling error? Investigators looked through all of her paperwork, her crossword puzzles, all anything she could have written on, and they found out that she had made that mistake before, but it was heavily debated because most of the time it really did seem like a one-off, so it wasn't something she consistently got wrong. And this could also have been the attacker's spe spelling error, so if she didn't write the message herself, whoever had written it, that could be you know, their spelling error and not hers. Um, it could also have been a way for her to prove that she was maybe forced to write the message. Maybe she would have left a spelling error on purpose to basically show that she wasn't um, willfully accusing Omar. So that was another theory that was brought up. It's very, very hard to say. Now the experts on the prosecution side said that the handwriting was hers and that the messages weren't written because she was being forced. So they weren't written under duress and that the full message was written first on the wine cave door. And it was one meter above ground. It was actually very straight. So she must have been maybe standing or maybe on her knees when she wrote that message, but it was very level, um, which again, threw a lot of people off. I know people like who are fully sober and adults and still can't write on a whiteboard without, you know, going sideways. But anyway, this very first mes message, the prosecution believed that this first message was the full one written on that door. And then the second message was the half message on the boiler room door and that one was closer to the ground probably because she was already passing away or running out of energy. The experts on the defense side said that, <clears throat> I'm already losing my voice. The experts on the defense side said that the handwriting was inconclusive. You could not prove with certainty that the letters matched her handwriting and that some of the letters actually had been written over. So if maybe she dipped her finger in blood and started writing, she would have to go over some parts of the letters to make them full. And you could argue if you're really dying and trying to write a message, would you really care about how neatly the message is written as long as you can read it? Um, that's again, not something anyone can say for sure because we were not in that situation. So who knows what state she was really, really in. But experts found it strange that she would write the message twice, especially when the first one was so clear. Like the first one was kind of perfect. I mean, she wrote the whole sentence 
I, well, I'm assuming she wrote it. Whoever wrote the full sentence, like we're assuming Giden wrote it. She wrote the full sentence. Why would she bother writing it again on another door? And also in the crime scene photos, her hands did not seem to be that bloody. There were a lot of defense wounds and there was some blood on her hands, but um, according to some of the experts, there were no, there was no blood in her cuticles or no blood found under her fingernails. Again, very strange for someone who would, you know, repeatedly write a message in their own blood. So that was another debate. Omar's lawyer questioned one of the handwriting experts on the side of the prosecution. And after some of the questioning, the expert went from being 100% sure that it was Guillen's handwriting on the doors to being 60% sure. He actually said he was um, sure that two thirds of the handwriting was a match to Guillen, which means that it's not a match because if it's only two thirds, then it's not her handwriting. So this seemed to be more in line with what the experts found on the side of the defense, which is that only five out of the 10 letters matched the samples from Guillen's handwriting. So yes, some of the letters were a match to her handwriting, but only half of them. So, you know, is it just a coincidence? Is it really her handwriting? Was she being forced to write it? So many questions, so many variables. As for the typo or the spelling error, some of Guillen's friends were actually known to make that error themselves. However, like there was actual, you know, paper evidence that these friends would make that conjugation error, but police never investigated those. The defense brought up some very interesting points. I'll go through those points kind of like in a list. First of all, the nature of the murder did not line up with Omar's psychiatric evaluation or his criminal past because he did not have one. The murder and the wounds seem to be overkill, which usually suggests um, someone close to the victim. Like, the, yeah, the injury, the attack, the murder seemed overkill for basically Omar wanting money and being refused money. Like, it seems like such a disproportionate response. If, again, he was desperate enough to kill for some money, if he wanted money that bad, he would have stolen as much as possible and not just whatever was allegedly in her wallet, if there was any money in her wallet. Second of all, the first police report stated that police did not notice any fingerprints. And that phrasing was incredibly suspicious and questionable because fingerprints are rarely noticeable, especially in a basement or a cave that looks like the cave she was found in. This would explain why police never found any fingerprints. It could be because they actually never dusted for them. Because how could there have been zero prints, not even Guillen's fingerprints, in her own cave she was found in and used? Like, I don't understand how you can't find anything, any usable fingerprints or even unusable fingerprints. I, I don't get it. Police claimed that they did search for fingerprints and just didn't find anything, but there are no documents proving that they searched. So either they searched and they didn't find Omar's fingerprints, so they gave up, or they searched and found someone else's fingerprints and it didn't match Omar, so they gave up, or they never searched for any fingerprints and they missed out on p potentially finding the murderer. Third of all, do you say third of all? Thirdly, number C. Guillen was found one and a half meters away from the last message she allegedly wrote. That door was open when they walked in, so I'll put a picture of the cave again. How did she have the strength to move away and why? The position and the room she was found in were very, very odd. And again, the defense were like, why would she even turn off the light? It makes no sense. Why would she write a full message then turn off the light and then crawl back towards the boiler room in the dark because again there is no light and then she'd be like wait let me write another message in the dark and then run out of energy to finish the message and yet still move away from that door in a position that's facing back the way it makes very little sense so again we weren't there. Maybe this actually happened that way and there is no rhyme or reason because she was in agony. But again, these were questions worth um, looking into. Fourth of all, police claimed it took them 20 minutes to open that door because it was blocked by these three items. 
In their initial report, though, it actually didn't take them that long. So as the investigation, sorry, as the investigation kept going, they kept increasing the amount of time it took them to open that door. I'm not sure why, but in their initial report, it actually did not take them anywhere near 20 minutes. The defense team tried to basically prove they could block the door from the outside, but like using a pulley system, it seemed very elaborate. They weren't very successful in proving that um, whoever had attacked Guylaine would be able to shove that stuff behind the door while closing the door. Um, And when they did manage to do it, the door didn't resist for long at all because probably it wasn't properly blocking the door. But then again, we never truly know how long the door resisted for when police first went into that room. So again, it's hard to say. T- it's hard to say. Lastly, Guylaine owned a camera and the last few pictures she had taken were destroyed by police. Police said that they had seen the pictures. They were basically pictures of the house and some of her friends chilling by the pool. Um, some of the pictures were of her neighbor, I believe Francine actually. And police decided these pictures had nothing to do with the murder case. Not that they had nothing interesting in them, just that they had nothing to do with the mor- with the murder case. So they just destroyed them. Surely that's illegal. They easily could have quickly showed those pictures being like those. These are the last pictures she took. They have nothing to do. Look, basically, what's a few more pictures in that huge file anyway? They could have showed to the court that these pictures were truly irrelevant, but instead they destroyed these pictures. And now people wanted to know if police were hiding something. What if there was a clue in these pictures? What if there was something police had missed? Why on earth would you destroy pictures just because you don't believe they have anything to do with the case? And it was even more surprising that her family wasn't upset about police destroying these pictures. Her sister said that if police believed the pictures could be destroyed because they weren't important to the case, then they could be destroyed. She didn't care. She just trusted police. But just because police determined that the pictures had nothing to do with the case didn't mean that the pictures weren't important. And also, I would want to keep those pictures myself. If this happened to someone close to me, I'd be like, what do you mean you destroyed her last pictures? Like, those were her last days. Wouldn't you want to see what was in that picture is just out of sheer curiosity? I can't believe they destroyed them anyway. Despite all of this, Omar never really stood a chance because on the last day of trial, the prosecution had both doors brought into court, which really affected everyone. The entire room went very quiet when the doors arrived and the messages were the most important part of this case because again, if Guylaine didn't write them, then Omar was automatically acquitted. Ultimately, it didn't matter if police didn't properly verify Omar's alibi with the boulangerie or if they destroyed pictures or evidence. Um, It didn't matter that there weren't any DNA or fingerprints placing Omar at the crime scene. It didn't matter that one of the murder weapons was still missing or that the one they thought was used could not be the murder weapon. It didn't matter that Omar's clothes didn't have any blood on them or that his psychiatric evaluation highlighted just how unlikely it would be for him to brutally murder anyone out of anger. Once the doors arrived in the courtroom, the jury had a very hard time seeing Omar's name written in Guylaine's blood and not believe he was responsible. Now, looking at these doors, all they could think of was this could very well be Guylaine's last testament, her last effort to identify her murderer before dying in agony. And how could anyone ignore these messages when they might be Guylaine's dying confession? No one could ever risk that. Before the jury left for deliberation, Omar addressed the court in French this time and said, it's not me, I didn't kill her, she was like a mother to me. On February 2nd, 1994, this was quite a short trial, the jury was asked to deliberate and it took them over six hours to find Omar Haddad guilty of murder with extenuating circumstances. He was given an 18-year sentence, and when Latifa heard the verdict, she screamed before fainting and being driven to a hospital. 
Outside of the courtroom, the public was chanting innocent and was shocked that Omar was found guilty with no physical evidence whatsoever. Outside, his lawyer made a very controversial and very political statement saying, a hundred years ago, we were condemning an officer who made the mistake of being Jewish. Today, we're condemning a gardener because he made the mistake of being North African. In the statement, his lawyer was essentially comparing Omar to the Dreyfus affair where a Jewish officer was unjustly accused of spying and he was sentenced to life in a labor camp. And basically the lawyer was saying that because he is Moroccan, because he's not from here, because he never got an interpreter during his first interrogation, Omar is guilty. Quite a lot happened after the trial. Omar never stopped fighting from his prison cell and he kept hoping that one day he would be able to be acquitted. The King of Morocco himself got personally involved and he actually helped pay for one of the private detectives working for the defense team even after the trial was over. Shortly after the verdict, Omar's lawyer Jacques Vergès wrote a book called Omar Matué with the same spelling error and a journalist named Jean-Marie Rouard wrote an, his own book that he titled The Construction of a Culprit. However, this book was more the perspective of Guylaine's family and what they stood to inherit due to her death. It was very controversial. The book was very controversial and basically kind of involved the family in her own murder. He actually ended up having to pay them quite a lot of money because of defamation, so they ended up suing him. Um, so a few books came out, um, quite a few books later on would go on to be written about this case because obviously it is absolutely massive. And some new information was coming to light. For example, months after the murder had taken place, Francine Pascal told police that she had received a very strange phone call that Monday night. Um, the person said, your gardener has been up to no good. She wrote it with her own blood. This was a concerning phone call, but police um, couldn't figure out why she would wait that long to bring it up. She found it strange that she wouldn't report it the same night or when police were still investigating this before the trial. It was just very strange and also police knew that the phone call had happened after the murder had been shared on the news. So honestly, anyone could have phoned Francine Pascal, anyone who had her number or knew she was close to Guiren could have phoned to make this strange phone call. Um, one of the private detectives, working obviously for the defense team, speculated that the murder weapon could have been a letter opener, which is an item Guiren definitely used to own or owned herself in her house. However, it was never found inside the house. He got an interview with Lilian, the cleaning lady, and he showed her a picture of a letter opener. And I'm not sure if the picture was just of a random letter opener or if it was something that he knew used to belong to Guylain. Either way, Lilian was actually shocked when she saw the picture and confirmed that Guylain did own a letter opener just like that, but when she returned to the house after the murder had taken place or after the crime had happened, she couldn't remember ever seeing it again. Christian Vellard, who was one of Guylaine and Francine's neighbors, came forward to say that if Omar had gone from Francine's house to Guylaine's house during the lunch break, he would have noticed him, actually someone would have noticed him, on that path because Omar would have had to walk past Christian's house and it was just a tiny road. Um, I, I take it Christian was maybe in his front yard for that, to, for him to notice someone walking past his house. Either way, he went to police to claim that he never saw Omar and he would have noticed Omar um, that day. However, police didn't really take the testimony seriously, yet they had no problem believing the lady on the balcony saying, well, I was kind of on the balcony and didn't see him, so he didn't come home. 
1995, this was a big year for this case, a prisoner told police that his jailmate had bragged about being Guillen's murderer. He claimed that a few years back, he was going out with a cleaning lady who worked for Guillen and had gotten fired after stealing something. So the couple decided to take their revenge on Guillen by robbing the villa, and the robbery turned sour when Guillen basically caught them red-handed. They caught she caught them stealing so they had to murder her to silence her they didn't intend to murder her but they had to police did not believe this guy whatsoever because honestly again there were no signs of a break-in in the house nothing had been stolen aside from the cash and even then was there any cash we don't know and her attack happened in the cave not inside the house Um, Police believe that this guy was just trying to sound tough in jail. God knows what this guy was trying to prove by saying he was Guillen's killer, but nobody believes he was telling the truth. His story was pretty much made up. Liliane, the cleaning lady, got accused by her ex Pablo and basically so they were together at the time of the murder and he said that she told him she was working for Guillen that day on Sunday. However, she told everybody else that she was off and police were very interested in this because um, she wasn't supposed to be working that day. Um, The cleaning lady was not in on Sunday. However, she had told her partner that she was at work. However, Liliane explained to police that Pablo was quite controlling and abusive and jealous and he basically would annoy her so much so she just lied to him she told him that she was working that day but she actually spent the day with her daughter and her son-in-law without being bothered so she only lied to her ex not to anyone else she wasn't working that day and pablo had actually reported many times he reported her many times for beating him and threatening him with a knife But then she was the one claiming that he was controlling and jealous and so on. So the dynamic was very confusing and there's a lot of he said, she said. However, she responded to these accusations with, let's not exaggerate anything. One time we went clubbing and I broke the three teeth he had left. And another time I scared him with a knife, but nothing more. And in my notes, I wrote, yikes, because that is, imagine confessing to that. Imagine being like, look, he's overreacting. I just knocked his teeth out once. And then another time I threatened him with a knife. That is incredibly concerning behavior. On March 9th, 1995, Oma was denied a retrial since they did not believe that there had been any errors made in the first trial. So following that decision, Oma's uncle Mimun came forward to accuse Guilen's son. This was a very serious accusation. Mimun had worked as a butler for Guilen for 10 years and had actually become close friends with her. He even went as far as saying that he was her confidant. He claimed that Guilen's son often asked her for money and she would always refuse. He needed money to help start his company. She kept refusing, which really, really angered him and made him very angry and then Mimun claimed that he saw Giren's son try to strangle her until he intervened and pushed the son away. Giren allegedly told him if one day I am murdered it will be him you'll need to tell the truth. This is again the second most serious accusation in this entire case the first one being the one against Omar of course and it turns out that he actually never worked for Guillen as a butler there was actually no evidence of them ever really being close friends I believe he did maybe work for her somehow possibly because he was related to Omar, maybe she hired him for a different job but the timing of his confession was very suspicious And again, you would bring this type of story up before trial, not years later. So again, I don't think this made Omar look very good or his family look very good. This was a bit of a strange story to come up with later on. I don't know how much of it is true, but for the most part, I think police just dismissed it entirely. On May 10th, 1996, French President Jacques Chirac and the King of Morocco, Hassan II, made a deal to pardon Omar in an exchange for the release of a French prisoner who was in Morocco at the time. Now, this was a partial pardon. It lessened Omar's sentence from 18 years to four years and eight months, 
but it also gave him the opportunity to be released early for good behavior since he was honestly an ideal prisoner. He always behaved really well. He was very pleasant. He never caused any trouble. He was just honestly just keeping to himself and being uh, an ideal citizen in prison, I believe. So that meant he could leave prison as early as January 1998 after only six years in prison, but on two conditions. He would need an address once he left prison, which was fine because his wife could give that for him, to him, like he could use his wife's address where his family was living, they were still together, they were very much still married, and that was accepted, the address was accepted, and the second condition was that he would need a job. Now, he ended up getting a job in a halal meat factory in Marseille that was also approved by the judge or whoever makes these decisions. Um, He was offered this job by this company who was actually very kind and said, look, we don't see him any differently. He just does his job. We're happy to give him a job. So that's what they did. So once these two conditions were met, he was released from prison on September 4th, 1998. He was still under surveillance. Obviously, he was still being monitored closely just to make sure that he didn't flee the country, I guess, or commit any other crimes or bail on his two conditions. But he did serve six years, I believe. Yeah, he was released in 1998 and he had been in prison pretty much since 91. So six or seven years. He had spent six or seven years in prison and he was still very much considered guilty. This was not him being acquitted. He was not acquitted at all. He was just partially pardoned, which meant that he no longer had to finish the rest of his sentence. Obviously, if he had been acquitted, he would have been released immediately. Now, this was a step in the right direction, but it wasn't nearly enough for Omar. He wanted to be acquitted. He was innocent. He kept saying he was innocent. He kept fighting to reopen the case or even get a retrial. And he was on a lot of TV shows. He actually met the son of the Moroccan president who had a major role in his pardon. And he wrote a book titled Why Me? And then became a pseudo celebrity as in a very recognizable person. He wasn't like famous for anything. He was just more like people recognize him out and about when he was just trying to live his life and he hated it because he just wanted to live with his family and spend time with his wife and kids. He had missed out on his entire kids, uh, like, childhood basically he just wanted to work live a normal life and now he was being hounded by photographers journalists and just random people on the street usually um, either believing he was innocent or accusing him of murder in the early 2000s the captain who led the investigation wrote a book titled omar la tue meaning omar killed her so obviously it's just a slight difference in the phrasing which switches it to Omar is the culprit, basically. In 2011, a movie was made about this case, and this story is very widely referenced in pop culture or just in general. It's, um, again, I cannot emphasize how popular or well-known this case is. Um, The latest DNA developments reveal that there has been male DNA found mixed in her blood, so the messages written on the doors has male DNA mixed in the blood, which is very interesting. And there was also DNA found on the piece of wood, on the piece of timber, but it doesn't match anyone we know yet, and it definitely was not a match to Omar. So we have no idea who it belongs to yet, or why it's there, to be honest. It could be contamination, but I find it very interesting that male DNA was was found mixed with the blood, because then... Does that mean she really wrote the message herself? Who knows? And over time, it did come to light that they found four traces of DNA, as in four separate profiles of DNA, two of them male and then none of them matching to Omar. One of them matched someone from a database, actually. However, they needed additional testing to confirm whether or not that was a positive match, like a a sure match. And then the third DNA trace was found 21 times around the letters and handprints of Guylaine, as well as mixed to her own blood. So we'll just have to wait and see if any further DNA testing or any other databases could provide a match to these 
samples of DNA that were found at the crime scene and if we can find a new suspect or if we can rule them out as contamination, whatever it is, I hope this helps the case forward and it's just a question of waiting now. Now, I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions when it comes to this case. Um, I'm going to try and keep it cool. I'm, I'm not try I'm not going to get heated, I swear. I find it absolutely bananas that he was found guilty and sentenced to 18 years in prison, given the fact that there is absolutely zero physical evidence that ties him to the crime scene. Nothing at all. N nothing. I'm so annoyed that police never checked the correct boulangerie or that they never provided an interpreter or a lawyer for his first interrogation. I feel like that would have solved a lot of misunderstandings. Omar genuinely forgot that he called his wife that day, like around lunchtime. Like he genuinely forgot when it was he phoned his wife. So if he called her, if he thought he called her after his shift was over, then how does that make sense? Surely if you murder someone during your lunch break and then you make the effort to drive to a phone booth far away to call your wife and then come back and then you're interrogated by police, the first thing you're going to say is like, well, actually, you know what? I was actually calling my wife at 1251 at that phone booth far away as an alibi but he genuinely forgot he was like oh yeah you're right i did call her during lunchtime like that's the first thing you would to tell police like I, I find it strange that he could be involved in this murder and then forget he phoned his wife during lunchtime i don't know i find that strange now when it comes to the motive i'm not sure omar was that desperate for money as we've established um, he was not seeing any prostitutes that was a very serious misunderstanding he did gamble a little bit, but if he did need money, why didn't he ask Francine Pascal first? That's the one he was working for that day. Like, it would double your chances to ask pretty much both your employers for an advance, just in case the other one says no, if you're that desperate for money. Surely you would ask everyone. If you're that desperate to kill someone because they don't want to give you money, then you would ask the other person first. I don't understand why he would work for Francine that day and instead of asking her, make his way to Guylaine's house on a day he didn't wasn't supposed to work. And honestly, I'm not sure if he knew she would even be home that day. Like maybe she had plans. So why would he like walk 800 meters all the way to his other employer's house to ask her for an advance when he doesn't even know if she's gonna be home, like just ask the one you're working for that day. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and also now that's obviously just, this whole section is just my opinion and my thoughts. So just bear that in mind. Either way, both Francine Pascal and Guylaine Marshall got along with Omar and went out of their way to help him out. I think for the most part, Guylaine was trying to not give him any money in advance because she didn't think that was going to help him in the long run. However, they have both helped him out, you know, find a, they helped him out when it came to like paperwork or even like finding a place to live. If he was so desperate for money, I'm sure he could have like talked to them, explained his situation, and maybe they wouldn't have given him an Maybe they wouldn't have given him cash straight up, but maybe they would have helped him out in some other way. I don't know. I feel like because they were so close, I feel like if sh if Guylaine said no, I don't think his first instinct would be like f anger and then hit the person you're close to uh, again. Confusion. Now, there are always exceptions, of course, and I do understand that. But based on the psychiatric evaluation for Omar, he did not seem likely to snap or even become angry just because someone denied him something. The murder itself seemed way overkill. So there was no need to stab her so many times or even disembowel her. And according to the prosecution, Omar hit her on the head out of anger. And then once he realized what he had done, he decided to just like kill her so that she wouldn't like report him to police or like get him in trouble. Then like, why go overboard then? If you're like, oh shoot, I shouldn't have done that. I'm just gonna have to like, kill her just so she doesn't talk, then you don't need to proceed to stab her 12 times. Like, so brutal. It, it doesn't... Why would you attack her so brutally if all you're trying to do is 
correct your mistake by making sure she doesn't speak to police again. I don't know. And if you're really that desperate to make sure someone's dead and won't identify you, surely you would stay until you're sure the person is dead or can't possibly get back up. You wouldn't just kind of like brutally attack someone and stab someone 12 times and disembowel them and then just walk away. Because again, according to the prosecution, she got back up and started writing on the doors. That doesn't make any sense. I feel like if you're really, clearly someone wanted her very dead, I don't think they would have left without making absolutely sure she couldn't get back up. As for the message on the doors, I find it so strange that the messages Omar Matui and Omar Mate were written twice on two different doors that were in two very, very different parts of the cave. Which one was actually written first? You're telling me this lady was attacked in, let's say, the middle of the cave. It's hard to tell where the initial attack happened, where she was hit on the head. And then she basically got stabbed multiple times, waited for her attacker to leave, got up, went to the wine cave door, wrote a message, like perfectly straight, perfectly level, a really clear message, then blocked the door that was already locked. Like the, the door to the cave was locked twice, but she still decided to move stuff to block the door, then turned off the light. And then there was no way she could see anything in that place. There was no other source of light. She still managed to crawl back to the boiler room and then, for whatever reason, and then decided to wait, actually, let me write this message again. And then, I, don't, like, I just don't get it. Started writing the message again and then run out of energy or maybe just, I don't know, run out of stamina and then you would think that would be it. The person would collapse on the floor. However, she didn't, she wasn't found in front of the mess. the last message she was believed to have written. She was found 1.5 meters away in a very opposite direction. And I just, like, I don't get it. Like, why would she turn the light off? Why would she block the door? Surely if she noticed the door was already locked twice, because obviously if you're getting back up after this attack, you're gonna try and leave to get help. She must have noticed in this situation, in this scenario, that the door was locked twice and then she would just block it again to make sure no one could get to her and then turn the light off and then crawl back to another space, try writing a message again, then crawl some more. And in this situation, why was her bathrobe still above her hips, like above her waist? Like why was her bathrobe still up? It doesn't seem to make sense if she did get back up that her bathrobe would stay up. Again, it's hard to say in these situations, you can't just apply logic, but I don't know. I just have so many questions. Obviously she had been very seriously attacked and she was in agony. So I do appreciate that, you know, even if she moved around the cave and blocked the door and managed to do all these things, a lot of the details might not add up because we have no idea, um, what mental state she was in if she did survive the attack and walked around. So regardless of the spelling error, the message itself is very strange. I find it so bizarre that if you know you're going to die and you're just looking to write the name of the person who attacked you, you could have just written Omar or Omar did it. But Omar killed me. It just it sounds like something you would write after you've died. It's a very strange phrasing and that doesn't mean anything because if she did read that, if she did write that message, then, you know, she wrote what she wrote, whatever state of mind she was in, maybe that's what she came up with. I don't know, but I do find it very strange that th that phrasing was used and not only was it used once, it was used twice and she could have just written Omar or Omar did it. Um, I guess she, she, maybe she knew she was going to die and then that's just her way of saying like, I'm dead and that's who did it. I don't know. But it's just very, very strange phrasing. Now, I definitely believe that the examiners made a genuine error when it came to the date of death. Um, I really believe she passed away on Sunday around noon. I don't believe Monday was the correct date. She hadn't been seen or heard from since Sunday noon. She never showed up to that party. And then all her friends, even her doctor, came over Sunday and, and even Monday and she was nowhere in the house. So obviously that must mean she was already in the cave 
And again, I don't think she would have survived until Monday. I don't think she would have survived this attack. And the autopsy made it clear that she must have lasted 15 to 30 minutes before passing away. So I just wanted to put it out there that I think it's a genuine error. It's a very serious error in the autopsy report. But I think most people believe that she passed away Sunday around noon. I am incredibly puzzled as to who could have wanted her dead in such a brutal way. Um, I have a crazy theory. And again, this is like just my personal opinion. I'm not trying to like offend anyone else involved in this case. This is just what I think. Um, with all due respect, I feel like somebody went in the cave to confront her or even murder her because again, it would be a very strange place to confront um, Guilen for Omar. Like, if he wanted money, why would he meet up with her in the cave? This seems like a very inappropriate place to have a conversation about money. She might have, you know, welcomed him somewhere else. I just don't get it. But someone must have gone to the cave to confront her or simply to murder her, which means they would have brought a weapon with them. Um, I don't believe that someone would have hit her on the head and then left the cave and then come back to stab her. Again, what do I know? That's just my theory. I don't believe she ever got up after the attack. Um, I think the attacker would have made sure that she was dead before she got back up. And I think the message on the boiler room door could have been partially written by Guilen under duress and the attacker realized that she couldn't finish the message or maybe she wasn't like cooperating so they dragged her to the wine cave door because i think on the walls they were too ragged you needed a smooth surface so brought them to the other door and wrote it in full with her finger and her blood and then maybe dragged her back to the boiler room by her feet which again would explain the position she was found in with her hands above her head and her bathrobe hiked up. It would also explain why the message on the full message on that door was written so neatly um, because given the state she was in again would she have been able to write the message like this? I don't know but that could be an explanation as to why the message was written so neatly. I also don't believe she would have barricaded the door herself. It seems like counterintuitive but if someone else had been involved then and again i'm not saying this is not omar but if someone else had been involved then maybe they could have moved her back to the boiler room close to the door where the message was written so it kind of looked like she had just written it and gone out another door because the wine cave room was locked the entire time so the door which had the full message written on it was locked when police arrived and it's the one room police never went into. There is absolutely no documentation that describes the room or that describes police going into that room and in court none of them were able to give you a layout of the wine cellar that was in that room and that room happened to have a window. So could an attacker have blocked the cave main door from the outs from the inside, sorry, making sure to delay police or deter anyone else from entering even with the key and then taking the exit through the window, locked the cave door. It's hard to tell, like this is a bit of a kooky like theory, but that's all I can think about and I just don't get it. Like I have no idea how anyone could have gone into the cave and left through that main door and up that staircase without leaving any evidence behind. I also don't understand how Omar could have committed this murder without receiving any blood on him. It's such a mystery. I know legally it was solved, but again, I have zero answers. And who knows, Omar maybe did murder her. Either way, it's absolutely terrifying to think that he was sentenced to 18 years with zero physical evidence. That is terrifying. And I hope I'm never in that situation one day because to think that someone could sentence you for that long with just maybe circumstantial evidence or just suspicion, very scary. Anyway, 
Just to wrap up this video, it has been such a long video, so if you've made it this far, thank you, I love you, congratulations, you are a star. I do want to point out though that there is very little known about Guylaine Marshall, that's why I never really brought her up, so I do apologize if throughout this entire video you're like, I can't believe you're not mentioning the victim, but honestly, she was incredibly secretive, she, w she just kept to herself. She has very close friends, and even her close friends had no idea if she was seeing anyone, dating anyone. Honestly, if anything unusual was going on in her life, no one else knew about it, or if they maybe do, they're not coming forward with the information. I genuinely wish I could have spent half this video talking about Guylaine, and there is just nothing, nothing about her aside from her family and friends describing her as a woman of character who was very kind, very generous, but who also didn't ever allow anyone to cross her boundaries. Her son came forward to say that the court during court, way too much had been shared about his mother already, and he didn't want anyone else to find out more about her. I guess he just wanted to preserve some sort of like privacy around his mother. So, whatever other information, I cannot t possibly tell you what she liked or what she did or who she was as a person, and I'm really sorry about that. Unfortunately, this is just a very strange situation where she was so secretive and so private that no one else really knew what was going on in her life. I've always felt like this case is like the O.J. Simpson version, but like French. Like the French version of the O.J. Simpson case, just in terms of like media coverage and how popular it is in France, but I also feel like it's the like m mirror case, like the opposite case of O.J. Simpson. Because Omar got sentenced with no physical evidence against him, and then O.J. got acquitted despite the evidence against him, so I always... Maybe I'm wrong. Tell me what you think. I always felt like this was the O.J. Simpson of France, but like opposite. I don't know why I'm saying this. But it frustrates me to no end that Guylaine Marshall never got any justice. Ever. If Omar did murder her, then he got away with a ridiculous sentence, and he now gets to live with his kids and family, like, living his life. And if someone else murdered Guylaine and Omar was framed, then his life was ruined for absolutely no reason at all, and the murderer got away with it, and Guylaine never got justice. So either way, I feel like she never got any justice, and it was so unfair for her, and that's what probably frustrates me the most with this case. I really genuinely hope that some of the DNA profiles will give us some answers in the future. There is, this is not a closed case. There is still some investigation going on. I think they're still trying to get answers, but until somebody comes forward and confesses or someone comes forward with any further information, I don't know, I don't think we'll ever know for sure what happened in that cave. Like, I genuinely don't think we'll ever get the answer. And if I could have a superpower that would give me like the power to like find the truth about just one thing. I don't care about the meaning of life, just tell me what happened with this case that's keeping me up at night. This is a case I've been thinking about nonstop, and I've been working on it for like two weeks and I close my eyes at night and I'm like, what happened? I need to know for real, like a play-by-play -play of what happened in that cave. I need to know why the door was blocked, which message was written first, who wrote it, what happened, like why, who, why, so many questions. I. It's just an, an, it's an enigma for 30 years, and this is one of the first true crime cases I ever heard of growing up. I remember being like six or seven and hearing about this case, and all I knew back then as a child was a gardener had murdered this lady in a cave. That's the only information I got, and even then I was really young, so it's not like I was really like interested in true crime. But I also remember that one of my school friends, like I would walk to school with one of my friends, but they were like compulsive liars, but he told me that the murder happened in a house in my hometown because I guess we just walked past a house that had like a garden. He was like, oh yeah, that's where the Omar case took place. And I just believed him for over a decade. So growing up, I genuinely would like randomly walk past the house and be like, wow, I can't believe the murder happened here until I was old enough to be like, what the hell? Absolutely not. Anyway, that's just a random fact. I'm absolutely losing my mind. I've been filming for so long. But anyway, this um, is a case I will think about forever. And I genuinely hope it gets fully solved. I want the full details 
for everything, for every part of it, and I don't think we'll ever get these answers. Um, I hope Guylaine can finally get justice one day, but we'll see how that goes. Either way, thank you so much for making it this far. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, this is um, my massive case and like this is the case for me. <laughs> so I'm sure you all have a similar one. Um, let me know down below what yours is. Maybe it's this one after you've watched this video. Um, it should be because again, I want answers. And the next video will be <laughs> hamster content. I'm taking a little break. I need a break. I need to do something fun. Um, so, you know, if you, I'll still be making true crime after, but the next video will be hamster and there will also be a giveaway in the next video because it feels more appropriate to do a giveaway on a hamster video than on a true crime video. But um, I am so close to reaching a thousand subscribers and I do believe by the time I post my next video that will happen. So stay tuned and thank you so much for watching. I'm just going to go to bed. <laughs> Please like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Bye.